Before you begin today's dissection, it is of paramount importance that you begin the study of the framing of the skull. But for orientation purposes and without spending the time required to review each and every one of the foramina, let's take an interior view of the skull with the anterior portion of the skull facing upward on your screen. Looking downward in the cranial cavity now, we see the very large foramen called foramen magnum. This is a landmark, it is posterior and it is in what is known as the posterior cranial fossa. It is at the base and it is here where the spinal cord and dural coverings are continuous with that of the interior of the skull. Forward of that area you see some fairly large bony ridges. This is the petrous portion of the temporal bone and it divides then the posterior cranial fossa from the middle cranial fossa on each side. And then forward of that, the roofs of the orbits form the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. In addition, we have a very obvious depression in this area called the hypophyseal fossa. And it is in this location that the hypothesis is found. Some major foramina that can be seen, we have here the optic canal through which the second cranial nerve will pass, the optic nerve. Just off of the midline, you see that this bony plate is fairly perforated with small holes. This is called the cribiform plate and in through this area will pass the filaments of the olfactory nerve. Other foramina that are readily visible here is the foramen ovale, part of the carotid canal behind it, the entrance into the temporal bone for passage of the seventh and eighth cranial nerves. Back behind in this region, the jugular foramen. Now, in order for us to appreciate the anatomy of this region, we will then go to the interior skull on the cadaver. Again, our relationships are quite obvious. We have deep within, again, foramen magnum in the posterior cranial fossa area. Anteriorly and laterally, the middle cranial fossa and then the anterior cranial fossa in front. We were talking about dura before around the spinal cord, completely surrounding it, and we have the same thing here in the cranial cavity. The dura in the cranial area, though, is specialized into two subregions. The periosteal layer, that is the periosteum of the bone of the interior of the skull, and as well as the complete tent-like covering, which is the meningeal portion of the dura. In order to remove the brain to see our interior anatomy, we've had to cut some of these relations. And now if I take the dura and put it over this area again like a tent, you can see this, the meningeal portion of the dura mater. And the meningeal portion of the dura mater has specializations, not only this tent-like covering, but down along the midline, we can see a partition, an incomplete partition, nevertheless, but one which separates the right cerebral hemisphere of the brain from that on the left. This is the Falk's cerebri. It is sickle-shaped inside view, 
And the illustrations in the textbook in Atlas show this up quite well. There is another tent covering of Dura. And this tent covering separates the cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellar hemispheres so that only uh, the lower part of the brain and then the spinal cord would project through this opening. This is the tentorium cerebelli, the tent covering the cerebellum. And then when we reflect that and go far into the posterior fossa area, we will see a very, very thin little segment on the midline which separates the right from the left cerebellar hemispheres, and this is the Falx cerebelli. So three areas of specialization then. The tent-like covering, the tentorium cerebri, the Falx cerebelli, and the Falx cerebri. Inside view again, this midline separation, the Falx cerebri, attaches all the way from the back area, swings forward in a sickle-shaped manner to attach uh, in the anterior area between the two orbits. In this material that we just talked about are the major cranial veins that drain the brain. On the midline, and fairly well shown without requiring any dissection here, is the major vein of the midline of the head, the sagittal sinus. This is a vein that will drain the cerebral hemispheres and coalesce these veins into this area. It is unpaired. It is the superior sagittal sinus. The inferior sagittal sinus is much, much smaller. It is found in that Falx cerebelli. It is a tiny vein. But the feeding and the drainage of this vein is towards the back of the head into the area of the internal occipital protuberance. Recall again that the external occipital protuberance was on the exterior of the skull. The internal is directly on the other side of the bone. And these unpaired veins, the superior sagittal sinus and the inferior sagittal sinus, will drain towards that region of the internal occipital protuberance. From that point on, the blood will flow to the right and to the left in the transverse sinuses that are found within this dura mater. They gr literally will groove the bone. And what to see them, what you will do is cut along this area and follow the transverse sinus laterally, both to the left and to the right. It is horizontal, this vein. It is well above the foramen magnum area, where the jugular foramen is also found. And in order to get down there, this horizontal vein, the transverse sinus, now has to take a sigmoid course downward, a curvy course down to empty and pass through the jugular foramen where it continues downward as the internal jugular vein. In addition to this, we have some smaller sinuses, but I think we can see what I was speaking of a moment ago in this general area, we have now some darkening indicating the course of the sigmoid sinus coming off of the horizontally placed transverse sinus. In addition to this, we will find a very small hairnet-like plexus of veins called the basilar plexus. It's on the base of the skull, just in front of frame and magnum. In addition to those, we have the confluence of sinuses, and that is where the superior sagittal and the inferior sagittal and the transverse sinuses all come together. There's a confluence of these structures in this location. Also farther forward,
you will see structures that will run right along the petrous bone. And in addition to that, uh, there will be some unpaired sinuses running along the back edge of the frontal sinus. In this area, we will pass then draining the blood from the dura downward into this region. Also, we have cranial nerves that show up quite well in this illustration. Starting up at the top, in the anterior portion of the skull, we have the first cranial nerve on each side, the olfactory nerve. Directly behind it, and well shown here on the left, going into the optic canal, is the optic nerve. The one on the right side is cut short. Here is the internal carotid artery as it comes up to supply the base of the brain. The trochlear, uh, the oculomotor nerve, the third cranial nerve, is shown well on both sides. The fourth nerve, the trochlear, is an extremely small, thin, thread-like nerve, and it has been removed on both sides as the brain was removed from the skull. So first cranial nerve, second, third, fourth removed, and then here the fairly large nerve, the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal. The sixth cranial nerve is found back again close to the midline. You see it's an extremely thin small structure. It is found only on the right side having been removed from the left side. This sixth cranial nerve is the abducens. Further back now, we have the seventh and eighth cranial nerves passing into the petrous portion of the temporal bone. This is the facial and auditory nerves. Further back uh, than that, better seen on this side, are three nerves going into the frame and off of the tip of my probe. And these are the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh. Glossopharyngeal, the vagus nerve, and the accessory nerve. And fibers of accessory coming up from the beginning of the spinal cord and going through this foramen. Again, nine, ten, and eleven. Glossopharyngeal, vagus, and spinal accessory. And then further down, almost at the foramen uh, magnum level, we can see the vertebral artery coming up on this side and a small nerve passing into the bone. This is the hypoglossal or 12th cranial nerve. One of the areas that you should look for, another specialization, of the dura is found here. Remember we said that this is the hypophyseal fossa and a thin dural covering overlies the hypophyseal gland and it is called the hypophyseal diaphragm or the diaphragma celli because this bony depression is referred to as the cella tersica. The dissection continues then as you very carefully work in the area to the right and the left side of the diaphragma celli and the cella tersica to remove the, this, the meningeal portion of the dura to trace out the cranial nerves three, four, five, and six. And it is in this area that we have a very small hairnet-like venous plexus called the cavernous sinus. This cavernous sinus is extremely important because it receives direct venous drainage from the orbital area as well as the base of the brain and from the dentally important region where you will be giving mandibular block anesthesia. These veins do not have valves. The blood can flow back and forth, but it is extremely sluggish in the cavernous sinus. If perchance there is a venous infection from the upper half of the face that gets through the orbit into the cavernous sinus or an infection from 
a non-sterile dental needle, this area then becomes the seat for the development and enlargement of that infection. This is a perfect culture media, human blood in a sluggish pool. And therefore, you will then be involving cranial nerves that will control eye movement, possibility of involving even some of the artery here of the internal carotid system, and then you would spread it through the arterial plexus, and also the fifth cranial nerve, which controls the muscles of mastication and is sensory to most all of the oral structures. We've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.